In some games, the only winning move is not to play. Since 2018, Russia has been working on upgrading its second strike capabilities with an array of new, terrifying doomsday weapons. These include a new ICBM called the Sarmat and a maneuverable hypersonic weapon named the Avangard. But the most notable of all is the Poseidon, a high-speed nuclear-armed underwater drone designed to devastate coastal cities and harbors. Now, Russian state television is claiming that the Poseidon, nicknamed the Flying Chernobyl, could be deployed against the United Kingdom as a punishment for its military aid to Ukraine. This would involve detonating a high-yield cobalt warhead near the British coast and flooding the country in a radioactive tsunami, destroying all life forms and sterilizing the earth. Britain would be turned into a radioactive desert, permanently unusable for anything. The doomsday weapons that are in development hold stark consequences. And should Moscow suffer further setbacks in its war in Ukraine, the threat of nuclear escalation will slowly inflate. So why did the Russians develop these doomsday weapons in the first place and can they really inflict a nuclear winter? Today's video is sponsored by Masterworks. According to Deloitte, the total wealth held in art is projected to grow from the current $1.7 trillion to $2.6 trillion by 2026. That is $900 billion in growth in just a few years. Considering the ongoing conflicts worldwide and inflation rates, I want to invest in alternative assets. Traditional portfolios heavy on bonds and stocks are just not enough. Masterworks is the platform I use. Let me illustrate how it works. So I have my eye on this painting by Cicely Brown. She is one of the most important contemporary painters living today and the price appreciation of similar works sits at 22%. That is exciting and I want to get in on that action. All I do is hit the invest button, fill in the amount and now I'm going to cut out the next step because it holds billing information and voila, I'm now a proud stakeholder in this energetic work of art. Masterworks is the only platform that allows retail investors like myself to own a slice of artwork. And though past performance is no guarantee for future results, Cicely Brown's 22% track record is pretty impressive. If you want to join other Caspian Report subscribers, use the link in the description to skip the waitlist and get started on Masterworks. Since the development of continental ballistic missiles in the late 1950s, the United States and the Soviet Union maintained the global nuclear balance by a state of suspended terror known as Mutual Assured Destruction, or MAD for short. In this scenario, both sides could inflict enough damage to make nuclear conflict pointless. As such, both sides were locked in an equilibrium where neither side could defeat the other nor had any incentive to disarm. Ironically, nuclear deterrence is one of the reasons the Cold War never turned hot. Instead of nuclear war, the geopolitical rivalry was restricted to proxy conflicts, alliance building and economic warfare. During the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union could cooperate on arms reduction at the nuclear level while waging proxy conflicts elsewhere. But there are limits to MAD. Great powers will always seek military advantage, even at the expense of global stability. On the nuclear level, a state can achieve this by developing an effective missile defense that nullifies its adversary's capabilities. But this is more pernicious than it sounds. In practice, missile defenses are far more effective against retaliatory strikes than first strikes, since the aggressor chooses the time and place of confrontation. Ergo, if one side has an effective missile defense, both sides are driven to attack preemptively, undermining MAD. 
In other words, missile defense systems motivate nuclear states to shoot first and ask questions later. For these reasons, missile defense forms a key part of Russia's threat perceptions. And since Moscow cannot compete with Washington on missile defense due to costs, its goal is to maintain the mad equilibrium. Not only is this key to Russian defense policy, but also its political stature. Essentially, MAD allows Russia to flaunt itself as a great power with a fraction of the United States and China's military budget. Leaked State Department documents show these dynamics at play. In April 2007, Russian and American representatives met for secret high-level arms negotiations. Missile defense dominated the talks, as Western missile interceptors were to be deployed in Poland and the Czech Republic. The Americans claimed the measures were directed at Iran and North Korea, but this was disputed by the Russians, who insisted that neither country was likely to develop ICBMs for decades, and if Washington felt Iran threatened Europe, it could move its missile defense facilities to Turkey. As it stood, the proposed Central European sites appeared to be directed against Russian missile systems. Moreover, the Russians noted the facilities could be upgraded in the future. So while they weren't an immediate threat, they could be one in the long term. American lawmakers downplayed Russia's concerns, claiming that the measures weren't intended to be used against them. Yet, the Russians cared little for Washington's professed intentions. They cared far more about American capabilities. Attempting to appease Russia, Washington agreed to move the missile interceptors onto Aegis cruisers. However, NATO enlargement, which Moscow saw as an existential threat, kept the two states on a collision course. In response, Russia soon redoubled its weapon modernization efforts, carrying out secret tests both in and around the Arctic. Fast forward a decade and Putin announces the development of new doomsday weapons in March 2018, including a new ICBM called the RS-28 Sarmat, a nuclear-tipped hypersonic weapon named the Avangard, and a nuclear-armed underwater drone later known as the Poseidon. Let's go over these one at a time. The Sarmat began development in 2009 and was successfully tested in 2017 at the Plisets Cosmodrome, 800 kilometers north of Moscow. The missile can deliver up to 15 independently targetable thermonuclear warheads. This means a single bomb will have a destructive power up to 750 times greater than the Hiroshima bomb. Furthermore, the Sarmat is designed to evade missile defense. It is faster than the Satan and has a brief boost phase before going cold, making it difficult for American space-based infrared sensors to track. The Sarmat's purported 35,000 km suborbital range also allows it to fly over the South Pole, bypassing missile defenses located in Europe and America. This is supplemented by fractional orbit bombardment capability, allowing the Sarmat to briefly enter space before dropping back into the atmosphere and onto its target. On top of all this, missile launch sites will reportedly be protected against a western first strike by the Mozor system, which can discharge clouds of metal ball bearings, kinetically destroying incoming missiles at up to 6 km in altitude. The second weapon, the Avangard, is a hypersonic glide vehicle that attaches to the Sarmat and other ICBMs. The Avangard differs greatly from existing delivery systems. In addition to traveling faster than Mach 6, the vehicle's maneuverability means that it can rapidly change course. This makes it impossible to intercept since existing missile defense systems track objects following a ballistic arc. The Avangard is thus ideal for short notice strikes against air defenses and command and control facilities, which could leave Russia's enemies deaf, dumb and blind. 
The third major weapon is the aforementioned Poseidon, which can be mounted on B-19 Sarov and Oscar II class submarines. It is comparatively small and its ability to travel at great depths at up to 70 knots makes it potentially immune for any countermeasures. The destructive potential of the Poseidon is difficult to understate. Russian sources say it has a combined warhead capacity of up to 100,000 kilotons. But that is highly exaggerated. Its real warhead capacity is presumably around the 2000 kiloton range, which is enough to wipe out the London metropolitan area, but not enough to flood Britain in a radioactive tsunami. In addition to destroying coastal cities and low-lying areas, the Poseidon could be deployed as a tactical weapon against naval assets like aircraft carriers and its nuclear engine gives it unrestricted range, meaning it could theoretically be launched from almost anywhere in the world. Nevertheless, the Poseidon's destructive power means it will probably be used as a second strike weapon of last resort, since Russia's main objective is to uphold the mad equilibrium rather than directly engage Western militaries. The Russian Navy has plans to procure at least 30 Poseidon drones split between its northern and pacific fleets. Should it do so, the deterrent effects would offset the advantage of an effective missile defense system. Yet even though Russia seeks self-sufficiency in defense, it is not autarkic. Rather, it depends entirely on technological imports. Foreign components are employed on all levels from microchips to raw materials, an addiction that began in the 1990s. You see, in the Soviet era, military engineers were treated like nobility. They enjoyed high wages and mingled in high society. But after the collapse of the USSR, many became unemployed, and those who still had jobs lost both salary and prestige. The prospects of aspiring engineers were poor. Some graduates did enter the arms industry, but many had to find other jobs to feed their families. The data backs this up. For example, the average age of a Russian military engineer is now around 50 years. And with old engineers retiring, there are too few young replacements. Former Deputy Minister of Defense Nikolai Makarov has observed that the fall of the USSR deprived Russia of its technological capabilities. So the Russian arms industry's death has been long in the making, and it was only accelerated by the Crimean annexation of 2014. Following the resulting sanctions, manufacturing outlets in the Ural struggled to obtain components from the West. Accordingly, the much-anticipated Armata tank was never mass-produced and is currently running nearly a decade behind schedule. The new raft of sanctions leveled this year will only compound this issue, spreading it to all aspects of weapon development and production. Consider this image from inside the Motovilnitsky factory, a major producer of Russian rocket launchers and artillery systems. The engineer uses a turnmill industrial machine from an Italian company, Taki Giacomo e Filio. This equipment is essential for making armored vehicles. Yet Russia has no domestic alternative of its own. Foreign machineries like these are integrated across the entire spectrum of the Russian arms industry. Take away those foreign technologies and modern Russia cannot produce industrial machines, bearings, ball screws, spidles, etc. It can certainly design some fancy weapons, which look great when paraded down Red Square, but Russia does not make the boring stuff anymore. And it's the boring stuff that sets a competent arms industry apart from an incompetent one. Nowhere is the loss of Soviet capabilities more apparent than in the production of Sarmat missiles. During the Cold War, many of the best Soviet missiles were made at the Yuzmash factory in Ukraine. Even when the USSR dissolved, 
Russia collaborated with Ukraine on making Dnieper space rockets which were modeled on the Satan ICBM. But when the partnership broke down over geopolitical tensions in Crimea, Russia lost access to its former allies' components and expertise. This has delayed the rollout of the Sarmat. And while Moscow expects the missile to enter service in 2022, full force modernization lags behind. All things considered, when a state faces geopolitical setbacks, superweapons have a seductive quality that can outweigh their actual benefits. Russia's new doomsday devices, as terrifying they are, will not deter the West from enlarging NATO or developing missile defenses. And as time marches on, Russia's conventional capabilities will fall further behind. Having said that, Russia's nuclear arsenal remains its ace in the hole. And in many ways, a weak nuclear armed state is more dangerous than a strong one, since it has less to lose. Policymakers from all sides should act more cautiously when developing the next generation weapons of mass destruction. A nuclear arms race is not a Mexican standoff where one side stands to win. It is a standoff between two sworn enemies knee deep in gasoline, one with three matches and the other with five. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Special thanks to Anton Murrell for researching this topic. If you like what we do and you want to show some support, please visit our Patreon platform and sign up or join our YouTube membership community. Either way, thank you for watching and Saul. So